Hello, can everyone hear me? Oh, no, you can't hear me. Right, hello, is that working better now? Is that working? Oh, it is now. Um, welcome to uh, this lecture today on what is the price of free trade. I'm very pleased to see everyone here today to talk about this topic which doesn't really seem to go off the news agenda at the moment, whether it's Donald Trump's tariffs on China or the vision of a global trading Britain post-Brexit. Um, it's something that we really don't seem to be able to stop talking about at the moment. I'm Gemma Tetlow, I'm economics correspondent at the Financial Times, and I'm delighted to be joined by Peter Lavelle, who's a senior research economist at the IFS, uh, for this public lecture. Um, I think this is going to be aimed at a, a general audience. I don't think Peter's assuming that anyone's studied huge amounts of economics before turning up here today, um, but hopefully we'll be able to have a bit of a presentation from Peter and then open up to questions from you to debate this topic of what is the price of free trade. It's something that traditionally economists have always thought of trade as being a good thing for countries, but you only have to look at the US Rust Belt or going further back, look at the cotton mills of Lancashire to think that maybe that characterization is a bit of a simplification. And hopefully Peter is gonna take us into some of those issues and how we might think about free trade. So thank you, Peter. Okay, yes, so thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for coming and thanks to the organizers. So the title of the talk is The Price of Free Trade. Uh, so I want to start by just talking about what I mean by the term free trade. So free trade means that uh, firms can sell goods and services across international borders pretty much hassle-free. So that might be true for, say, the UK's trade at the moment with other Euro member states of the European Union. So if a German firm wants to sell things into the UK, it can do it pretty easily. It doesn't have to pay any uh, additional taxes. There are minimal customs checks. Uh, the regulations are either the same in Germany as they are in the UK, or the authorities take the view that if it's good enough for the Germans, then it's good enough to sell in the UK. Uh, but that's not true um, of all trade. And in fact, most countries around the world put up some sort of barriers for goods moving across uh, borders. Um, with the aim of protecting uh, domestic industries. And that's true for the UK as a member of the EU at the moment. So say, for example, you want to buy some rum from Jamaica. So to do that, when you import it, you have to pay a duty on that rum, an import tariff. And that duty is about 28p per litre of Jamaican rum, plus a little bit extra depending on the value of the rum. Or to take another example, suppose you want to buy a hat and import it from Australia. So then you have to pay 5.7% tax tariff on the value of that hat. It's not just imports that are affected by these kinds of barriers. So uh, at the moment, uh, the UK and the US, or the EU and the US, uh, they don't trade freely with one another. So the US applies tariffs to products sold from the EU. The EU applies tariffs uh, sold to products from the US. And as Gemma was mentioning, so as if you've been following the news, you'll know that uh, trade might look uh, becoming, um, is set to become uh, less free uh, in the future. So uh, the White House uh, mentioned that they were going to put tariffs on steel and aluminium. Uh, today, they mentioned possible new trade uh, tariffs on goods from uh, China. Um, so it looks like, uh, um, uh, and other countries involved, the European Union and China have threatened some sort of retaliatory action if these kind of things are imposed. So they might impose new tariffs on American goods. Um, so why is this? Why is it the case that not only is trade not free, but it looks like we're moving to a situation where trade might be uh, less free uh, in the future? And the reason is because uh, trade is a topic that uh, has provoked really fierce disagreements uh, for a long time now. So if you take that current uh, trade controversy, this didn't come out of a clear blue sky in 2018. Uh, so trade was already a really big topic in the 2016 uh, uh, American presidential election campaign. So for those of you who've been living in a cave for the last two years, this is Donald Trump. He is president of the United States of America. And uh, uh, here he is in 2016 uh, talking about or giving his views on trade. In particular, he's giving his views on a trade agreement the United States has with its neighbors in Canada and Mexico called the North American Free Trade Agreement or NAFTA. And he associates this agreement with 
the devastation of American manufacturing. So he's just talking about particular parts of the US, you know, New England, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, that he thinks were really badly affected by cheap import p competition, particularly from uh, Mexico. Of course, that wasn't the only view. So his opposite number in the uh, presidential uh, election campaign of uh, 2016, this is Hillary Clinton. Uh, so she's talking about the exact same trade deal, but she sees it in really different terms. So for her, NAFTA, creating NAFTA um, was creating the largest free trade zone in the world, was uh, boosting US exports and creating jobs. And uh, this wasn't the first time we've had a dispute about trade. Uh, so uh, coming closer to home in space, if not in time, um, we can go back to a debate that happened in the United Kingdom um, uh, in 1846 about uh, the Corn Laws. So this was a series of taxes that the UK imposed on imports of corn or grain to the United Kingdom with the aim of keeping those prices high. And at the time, they were having a really fierce disagreement over whether they should repeal these tariffs or whether they should keep them in place. And again, people took different views on this. So this guy is uh, Benjamin Disraeli. He's a Conservative Party politician. He was later Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Uh, and he was arguing against repealing these duties. And uh, the reason for that is because he was worried about what would happen if we started importing lots of cheap corn from abroad, what would happen to those people who are working in producing uh, corn? Are those workers going to find new employment or would they move straight into unemployment? And, uh, but again, this debate had two sides. So this is a free trade activist from the 19th century, Richard Cobden. He incidentally um, was a manufacturer here in Manchester. Uh, and he calls the Corn Laws a bread tax. Because by raising the price of corn, it raised the price of bread. And he said that that was really bad for the working classes for whom bread was a really important part of their diet and part of their spending. And just so that you don't leave with the impression that trade is something we've only been discussing for the last 200 years, here's an example from over 2,000 years ago showing the ancient Greeks arguing about trade. So this is the Greek philosopher Plato. He wasn't a fan of free trade. Uh, his view was that um, uh, luxury goods that you don't need, uh, you shouldn't be importing them. Things that are not necessary, you shouldn't be importing them. Uh, so when Plato set out his ideas, he always set them out in uh, what's called dialogue form. So it's a bit like a play. There'll be different characters arguing different points of view and representing different opinions. So in this case, the person arguing with Plato was Plato uh, <laughs> in another one of his dialogues. And so his, his point was, well, Plato, that, you, know, you could do that, and there might have be benefits from that. But if you did that, uh, the problem would be you couldn't import some of the nice things, uh, finer things in life, uh, and you'd be creating a society that was quite boring. Uh, so he said, a city fit for pigs. Um, so one disappointing conclusion you could draw from this is that we've learned absolutely nothing in the last 2,000 years we're still discussing the same topic. We're still discussing whether we should be importing what we're consuming uh, or not. But I'm going to try and argue that uh, uh, we have learned something. So economics can tell us some things about uh, the pros and cons of trade and free trade. Not that it can settle the debate, because economics can't settle great moral questions. But what it can do is it can inform a uh, discussion of those questions. So. Let's talk about that. So in particular, I'm going to try and tell you three things today. So I'm going to tell you two uh, reasons that trade might be good. So the first thing is that trade increases choice. It has benefits to consumers in that it increases the amount of uh, variety of products there are. Uh, the second thing is that trade is something that means we can produce more things and that each country involved in trade can produce more as a result of uh, uh, trade taking place. But, and this is a really important qualification, so while it might be overall good for society if there's trade, within a society there are going to be winners and there are also going to be losers. And that's something important to take into account, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that uh, later. But let's start with the first of these. So let's talk about how trade can uh, increase uh, choice. So when Plato was talking about imposing restrictions on imports, his view was that... Um, uh, uh, Imports were bad for the uh, kind of moral condition of society. So he wanted in his ideal society to have this cast of people who called the guardians, and their job would be to decide what you can and cannot import. And uh, he was pretty clear. He gave some examples of the kind of things he thought you shouldn't be importing. So they included things like uh, spices, 
uh, incense, um, tables, uh, couches and furniture, and uh, cake. Uh, so to modern ears, that might all sound a bit uh, ridiculous, but there's echoes in that, in that all governments today don't necessarily just allow goods to come across the border. Um, they will reject things that don't meet certain safety standards, or don't meet standards of the uh, uh, host country in terms of um, hygiene and safety and so on. But what uh, an advocate of free trade will argue is that too many of these restrictions can reduce consumer choice. And to understand that, we're going to have to uh, discuss an example that's really close to my heart, which is cheese. So uh, this is uh, Liz Truss. She's a conservative MP. She used to be department, uh, head of the Department for Food, the Environment, and Rural Affairs. And in 2014, she was giving a, a, a speech on the subject of uh, uh, how much the UK was importing from abroad. And you can see she's really angry. And the reason she's angry is because, well, she's in the middle of saying, we import two-thirds of our cheese in this country. That is a disgrace. And, okay, so this, she, she made this point quite strongly in a speech on quite a mundane topic. So it became a sort of viral video and was repeated on sort of comedy programs and things like that. But for our purposes, she's missing something important. So she's missing a key um, uh, fact about the nature of the UK's trade in cheese. And that fact is this. So she's right, Liz Truss is right. The UK does import a lot of cheese. In fact, we can go on the internet you can go to the, if you go to the right website, you can look exactly how much the UK, uh, of cheese the UK imported in 2016. So it was around 480,000 tonnes, or 1.25 uh, billion pounds, if any of you do pub quizzes, the fact to remember. But um, at the same time as importing that amount of cheese, the UK was also involved in exporting cheese. So you exported about 164,000 tons of cheese, about 460 million uh, pounds worth. And when you stop to think about it, there's a bit of a puzzle there. So why would the UK be both importing cheese and exporting cheese at the same time? And the answer's in this picture, right? There are different varieties of cheese. There are UK varieties of cheese, you know, cheddar and Red Leicester and Wensleydale, and there are foreign varieties of cheese, like brie and gorgonzola and Danish blue. And what it means is the UK can export those British varieties of cheese, and it can import those foreign varieties of cheese. And that means that uh, uh, trade is going to increase the number of uh, varieties of cheese you offer. Consumers have a greater selection. You can pick the type of cheese uh, you want. And that has benefits to consumers. Um, and this is an example of what economists call inter-industry trade. So the same industries that are involved in importing uh, cheese that are facing this possible extra competition from imported varieties of cheese are also involved in um, uh, the same industries that gain from the advantage of extra export opportunities uh, in the cheese sector. Um, and what's particularly benign about this kind of trade is that those industries that are affected by these increase in imports are the same industries that are increase, uh, benefiting from the potential for increased exports. So those industries, they needn't shrink, even though there's more imports coming in, and they might even grow. So that's our first uh, uh, example of one of the positive impacts of trade. The second thing to talk about is that trade can allow us to produce more things, not just have a greater selection of things, but to produce more overall. Uh, and to discuss that, we're going to move on to another example. In this time, we're going to be talking about corn. And we're going to be talking about uh, the corn laws, which I mentioned before. So as I alluded to earlier, uh, this was a tax that the UK imposed on imports of corn into the United Kingdom in the early 19th century. It was, the way it worked was a kind of sliding scale. So when um, uh, corn prices in the UK became too cheap, they'd ramp up the duty to try and keep the prices high. And the purpose of that was to keep out uh, imported grain from uh, places like Germany, the United States, Poland, which are the places the UK got its food from uh, uh, at that time, and to support uh, the British uh, corn producing industry and corn, uh, corn farming. So the taxes were repealed in 1846 after a lot of debate. But while they were in operation, they seemed to have done their job. 
So at the beginning of the 19th century, prices for <laughs> corn in England were about 40% higher than they were in you know, a comparative place, uh, German port of Königsberg, where a lot of corn was uh, imported. Uh, but that difference in prices fell to zero after they repealed the uh, corn laws. And uh, that's the kind of thing that uh, would matter, particularly if you were the kind of person that consumed corn or indirectly consumed corn by buying bread. Uh, and uh, in Victorian England, a lot of that was done by the uh, working poor. So what this picture shows is actually St. Peter's Square here in Manchester, which is the site of uh, the Peterloo Massacre, which occurred uh, nearly 200 years ago. Next year will be the 200th anniversary of the Peterloo Massacre. And this protest was about a lot of things. There was talk about constitutional reform and political rights and things like that. But uh, in amongst the protests, there were banners saying things like no corn laws or abolish the corn laws. And that's because for these guys, they thought that the corn laws were something that protected wealthy landowners at the expense of them, the working poor. Um, but of course, so the corn laws had their supporters. We saw Benjamin Disraeli earlier talking about uh, uh, the people involved in producing uh, uh, corn, what's going to happen to them if you repeal these duties. And in answer to that question, the people who wanted to get rid of them, people like Richard Cobden, they had uh, uh, an answer. And the answer was uh, that uh, two things would go on that would shift these workers from corn producing to um, uh, another industry, the manufacturing industry. Uh, and the first one of those was is that corn prices would fall, and that would mean that the wages of people in working in factories would uh, go up, or the value of those wages. They could buy more than they could before. The second thing was, he argued, that in order to import more corn, you had to pay for those imports. In order to pay for those imports, you had to export more. So the manufacturing sector would have to grow to pay for those uh, imports. And those two forces were going to make it more attractive to work in manufacturing, and they're going to pull those workers who may be unemployed from making corn into, into factories in the UK. So why did he think this was a good thing? So what you need to understand is that both Richard Cobden and other uh, opponents of the Corn Laws were actually drawing on cutting-edge, latest economic thinking of the time. Uh, and that was set out here in one of the first modern economic textbooks, Principles of Political Economy and Taxation by David Ricardo, uh, that was published in 1817. And what uh, David Ricardo argued uh, in that book was he sets out key arguments for trade. And one of those is that um, by allowing countries to specialize in activities in which they had what he called a comparative advantage, it would allow them to produce more. And moreover, what it would allow them to do, what it would mean is that all countries involved would be better off than they were before. So to many people at the time when this was produced, and to many people today, this idea was profoundly counterintuitive. So to understand it, we're going to work through a quick uh, example. So imagine a situation sort of roughly meant to simulate what were uh, uh, the kind of conditions that were uh, uh, prevailing at the time that the UK uh, repealed the Corn Laws. So imagine there's 10 million workers in the UK, and they can work in two different industries. They can either be producing cloth or they're producing corn. So one situation could be the UK puts 5 million of those workers in the corn producing industry, produces, puts 5 million workers in the cloth producing industry, and uh, suppose those workers in the corn producing industry each produce f 5 units of corn. So overall the UK has 25 million units of corn being produced, and suppose that if they work in the cloth industry they produce 10 units of cloth, so we've got 50 million uh, units of cloth. Uh, and in this case, there's no trade going on, so how much of that can you consume? Well, you can consume what you produce, so the production and consumption sides of this are equal. Now suppose you wanted to help out those uh, people that were protesting at um, St. Peter's Square, and you want to reduce the price of corn, so you want to produce more corn than you were producing before. Well, it's easy to do that. All you need to do is shift workers from producing cloth to producing corn. So suppose we shifted a million workers into the corn-producing industry, then we'll have more corn, we'll have 30 million units instead of 25. 
But the downside is you've, um, by shifting them out of the cloth industry, it means you have less cloth than you did before. You've only got 40 million units when before you had 50. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the closest thing economics has to a magic trick. I'm going to show you how the UK can have this much extra corn while still having exactly the same amount of cloth it had before. And to show you that, I'm going to start with a thought experiment, which is suppose that in the forests of England, we discovered there was a machine. Uh, and this machine, what it did was, if you fed in uh, cloth into this machine, it would buzz and whir, and there'd be a kind of grinding noise and a whiff of sulfur, and then out of that machine would come some corn. So in particular, if you three, put three units of cloth into the machine, you get two units of corn out the other side. So how does this help us? Well, because what it means is that the UK could, say, shift three million workers from producing corn to producing cloth. Those workers now produce 80 million units of cloth. You take 30 million units of, those, uh, of, of, uh, of that cloth production, feed it into the machine, you get out 20 million units of corn. So at the end, you've got those 30 million units you wanted, and you still have the 50 million units uh, you started with for production. And the reason this works is because people working in the cloth industry, with the advantage of the machine, using the machine, are actually more productive at producing corn than the people working in the corn industry. Um, why am I telling you all this? Um, it's because, so in one sense, this machine exists. It's just it's another country. So, and the way you feed stuff into the machine is you export to that country. The way you take stuff out of that machine is you import those products from abroad. Um, so, and to show you how this works, um, uh, let's, consider, let's add in another country and, uh, and show you. So... Uh, Here's a trading partner for the UK. This is Prussia. Prussia's now in modern Germany. And they've also got 10 million workers. And let's start by assuming that they're split evenly between those two sectors as well, co corn and cloth. And uh, let's suppose that those workers produce these amounts. So the, corn produce, uh, the, uh, the people in the corn sector each produce four units of corn, so they've got 20 million units of corn overall. And the people in the cloth producing sector have produced five units of cloth each, so they produce 25 million units of cloth. So the first thing to notice is that uh, Prussia is actually less productive at both activities than the UK. Um, and you can argue about whether that's true today, but at the time, it arguably reflects uh, the circumstances. So the UK had more technology than its trading partners in both manufacturing and uh, in agriculture. Um, the second thing to notice is that while the UK is more productive at both activities, it's only a little bit more productive in producing corn than Prussia is. So the Prussian workers produce 20 million units of corn, in the UK it's 25. But Prussia is a lot worse at manufacturing than the UK. So the UK produces, each UK worker produces twice as much cloth as a Prussian worker. Um, and if you sum up those things, so overall the two countries are producing 45 million units of corn and 75 million units of cloth. So now let's repeal the Corn Laws. So let's allow these countries to trade with one another. What does that mean? So what the UK can do is it can do what it did before when it had the machine. It can shift workers into the cloth producing sector. So there's now 8 million there and there's 2 million in the corn producing sector. Prussia has shifted everyone from the cloth producing sector into the corn producing sector. So all 10 million workers are producing cloth. <coughs> So now the UK produces 80 million units of cloth, 10 million units of corn. Um, Prussia produces 40 million units of corn, no cloth, because no one's working in the cloth sector. So then what happens in terms of consumption? So um, what's happening now is the UK is producing these 80 million units of cloth, and then it exports 30 million of those to Prussia. So Prussia now has 30 million units of, of, of cloth to consume. At the same time, Prussia exports 20 million units of corn to the UK. So the UK has 30 million units of corn to consume and 50 million units of cloth. So what you can see is the UK has got more corn than it had before. 
and it has the same amount of cloth that it had before. Prussia has got more cloth than it had before and the same amount of corn. Uh, and the reason both countries have more than they had before is because you know, total production, if you look at it before trade was happening, it was 45 million, 75 million <coughs> units. And after trade, it's gone up to 50 million and 80 million units. So these countries have uh, done this, and they've done this by specializing. So corn, uh, Prussia specialized in the production of corn, and the UK specialized in the production of cloth. And we saw even though the UK was better at both activities than Prussia was to begin with, uh, both countries are, are better off through trade, not just one of them. Um, and they've done that by shifting into the industry that each country was comparatively better at, which is why it's called the principle of comparative advantage. Um, so did this happen? So were people like David Ricardo and uh, Richard Cobden correct when they said that there'd be this kind of shift from one sector to another sector? So this is the proportion of workers working in agriculture in the 18th and 19th centuries. So at the beginning of the 18th century, the UK was a predominantly uh, agrarian economy. 50% of workers were working in agriculture. By 1871, that had fallen to less than 20%. And the repeal of the Corn Laws is about in the middle of this. So where did those workers go? Well, a lot of them went into manufacturing. So you can see the share of workers involved in manufacturing increased over this time to 45% in 1871. So obviously, a lot of things were going on here. And I'd be a, a pretty poor economist, so I said all of this was due to the repeal of the uh, corn laws. But what it does show is that the economy made this shift. So it shifted from an economy where most people were involved in agriculture to an economy where more people were involved, hardly anyone was worried, involved in agriculture, and more and more people were involved in, in, in manufacturing. So you could shift from one, one situation uh, to another in the way that Richard Cobden argued. Now, this might uh, raise two questions in your mind. So you might think, first of all, Peter, why are you telling us about corn and cloth? We live in the modern world where we've got all kinds, we live in an age of wonders, right? We have things like the internet, and we've got Snapchat, and uh, what they call fidget spinners, and, and things like that. So what on earth does an example of corn and cloth have to do with this? So the first thing is, of course, I picked corn and cloth because that relates to the kind of things that were relevant for debate about the corn laws, but I could have picked anything. I could have picked sharks and inflatable cactuses. The example would still have worked. Uh, but the other thing you might say is that, well, trade in the modern world is far more complicated than, than what you've just described. <coughs> so you take something like an iPhone. So uh, you probably think your iPhone is made in China. Your iPhone is not made in China. Your iPhone is assembled in China. But it involves components that actually come from all over the world. So uh, some of them are made in China. Uh, the flat screen, uh, touch screen technology, that comes from Korea, South Korea. Uh, the microphone is made in Texas. Uh, the camera comes from Japan, uh, and so on. And all these things are uh, then uh, uh, put together in, in factories in, 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 in China and then sold, sold abroad. Um, but what's going on here is, is the principle underlying this sort of trade is the same. Because so each of those countries have specialized in a different aspect of the production chain of the iPhone. Um, but how do they do that? Well, when Apple's deciding how to do it, the best way to do it is that they all specialize according to their comparative advantage. So the, the, uh, the ideas underpinning this kind of trade are exactly the same as they were when uh, 200 years ago when this idea was first set out by David Ricardo. The second question you might have is, so you've just shown us an example where two countries, they traded and they were both better off after trade than they were before. They both had more after trade than they had uh, before it. So if that's true, why is it that countries seem so reluctant to trade with each other? Why are there all those taxes on imports that I talked about at the beginning? Uh, and why is it that trade agreements take such a long time to negotiate? And just to round that point home, I've got a few examples. So there's a Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's a trade agreement between 11 countries on the Pacific Rim. 
uh, that the documents underlying that trade relationship uh, run 5,600 pages. Um, to take a completely random but not untypical example of trade negotiations, so Japan and Colombia have been trying to negotiate a trade agreement. They started six years ago. They've had 13 rounds of negotiations. They still have not reached a deal. Um, and so the answer to that, the reason for that, is because trade actually creates competing industry, uh, interests with things to fight over. Um, so we saw when trade happens, these countries specialize. Some industries are going to shrink. The corn industry shrinks in the UK, but other industries grow. The cloth industry grew in the UK. So if you have people who are heavily invested in one of those industries, in those shrinking industries, they're potentially going to lose. So suppose you're a landowner and you have a large amount of land devoted to corn farming, you can't move that land into manufacturing, so the value of that land is going to fall when the corn laws are repealed. Or suppose you're uh, involved in the corn producing industry and you have a set of skills that are really important to doing that. You can't then immediately use those skills in the cloth producing industry, so that uh, investment uh, is lost. Um, but in the case of the corn laws, those who are advocating abolishing them, getting rid of these tariffs, they could present it as a fight between the little guy and a sort of fat cat monopolist. And that's how they did in the, in the politics of it. So you can see here, this is a cartoon from the time. There's a little guy at the top. He's got a shield on that says free trade. He's got these giant boots, which are actually representing the campaign against uh, the corn laws. And behind him, there's uh, the guy he's just beaten up who's a rich landowner, he's got a crown on his head, he's got a club in his hand that says Monopoly. So they presented this as a fight between wealthy landowners and uh, the working poor, urban laborers, or the little guy. Uh, but there's other cases where um, you might sympathize a lot more with the people losing out from trade than in the case of the Corn Laws. So let's move on to discuss that. And in general, let's move on to discuss uh, how trade can have winners and losers. And to do that, we're going to have to move on to another great trade controversy or another example. Uh, and this is 150 years later, what economists now call the China shock. Uh, so this is uh, around the time 2001, and this is the year that uh, China joined the World Trade Organization. Some people refer to it as the time that China officially joined uh, the world uh, economy. And as a result of joining the World Trade Organization, Chinese exporters now have these protections that are given by WTO rules. Uh, and that meant there was this large increase in Chinese exports going to places like the United States, the UK, and uh, the rest of Europe. And this was a huge shift in the, in the amount of exporting activity and trade going on. And uh, so years after this uh, shock happened, uh, economics researchers were able to examine the effects it had on uh, the labor market, particularly in the United States. And uh, what they found was, well, firstly, there were many benefits. So they found there was an increase in exports of the United States to China. Incidentally, a lot of that in industries that were supplying the Chinese industries that were then exporting to the United States. There were lower consumer prices of the kind of things they were importing uh, from China. Uh, but uh, there were some problems as well. And those problems were caused by the fact that, again, because it, trade was involved, China was specializing. And it was specializing in particular industries. So those imports were really concentrated in certain things. And those industries, those Chinese imports were concentrated in, were in turn concentrated in particular parts of uh, the United States. So uh, one of the resources that researchers have put together is from this website. It's called chinashock.info. You can go there yourself. And what it shows you is how uh, um, uh, this shock affected different parts of the United States and different industries. So on the right, you've got the industries that are affected by the China shock expressed in dollars per worker. What they mean by that is the amount uh, each worker in that industry would have produced had there not been this big increase in, uh, in imports from China. So you can see the affected industries there, so furniture and fixtures, games and toys, sporting athletic goods, electronic components, and so on. And on the left, uh, you've got uh, a map 
that shows those parts of the United States where those industries were concentrated and so that uh, uh, the effects were going to be greater. And what you can see is that there's a large amount of variation. So some parts of the United States were really badly affected and other parts uh, were less affected. So if you go to the website, it's actually a clickable interactive map. So you can hover your mouse over a particular part of the United States and you can see how that area was affected. So I've just picked out uh, one of the areas that was more affected, which is Bloomington, Indiana. And on the right side, you can see uh, the kind of industries that were affected in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, and uh, you can see, so household audio and video equipment was a major industry. It was really affected by an increase in imports and a lot of people happened to be working in that industry uh, in that uh, region. So that's one of the most affected uh, regions. But you could also find, you know, so here's Elko, Nevada. Elko, Nevada was barely affected at all by this increase in imports, uh, in, you know, in, at least in a bad way. So none of the, the industries that were affected really employed many people in Elko, Nevada. So people in that region, they would have benefited from the reductions in consumer prices. They might have benefited from the increase in export opportunities, but they wouldn't have been necessarily hurt by this increase uh, in imports. So as well as affecting different parts of the United States in different ways, the shock also affected different types of workers more than others. Uh, and in particular, so those affected by, or those working in those industries that were uh, affected by this increase in imports were disproportionately, they tended to be older, they tended to be less educated, they tended to be poorer than other Americans. And that's important because these are the, exactly the kind of people that would find it harder to shift from an industry that was shrinking to an industry that was uh, growing. So we've discussed three points. So with the example of cheese, we talked about how trade can increase choice and have benefits <coughs> from that. We've talked about how uh, different countries can produce more uh, through trade, how trade can make countries more productive. And then we also talked about, with the example of the China shock, how trade can have losers as well as uh, winners. So this is the kind of point of the lecture. So this is the price of free trade. So that um, trade involves specialization, and that requires workers to move industries. You require to move from an industry that's shrinking to an industry that's growing. And the problem with that is that, so in the example I gave earlier, we were able to shift workers around between those industries pretty easily without being problems. But some workers can't just shift uh, work like that. So they might have skills that aren't transferable. They might live in the wrong place. They might be living in Bloomington, Indiana, rather than Elko, Nevada, um, and so not be able to benefit from increased uh, export opportunities. So what this means is trade inevitably is going to create both winners and losers. But what it also tells us is that trade is going to work best when you can shift workers from those shrinking industries to uh, growing <coughs> ones. So how best do we manage this kind of thing? So I'm going to end with three suggestions uh, for how to do these things well. So the first one is to take account of the fact that there are some people from winning from trade and there are some people losing from trade. So if there are some people winning, you can sort of have an implicit social contract. You expect those people to help out uh, through, say, the tax and benefit system, people who are losing out from trade. The second suggestion is what I call gradualism. So this is the idea that when you're moving towards free trade, you don't do it all in one go. You manage it. You reduce tariffs slowly over time. You give people more time uh, to adjust to the shock. Um, and the third one is you help people move from those shrinking industries to the growing industries. So that might involve, for example, uh, worker retraining, job counselling, or other kind of labour market policies. And just to give you an idea of what I mean by that uh, third suggestion, so these are some screenshots I took from a community college in the United States, uh, in Seattle. And this community college uh, specifically offers courses uh, for people who need retraining. Um, so if you're in an industry that demand for your occupation has uh, fallen, you have this opportunity for um, uh, retraining, uh, specifically aimed at getting into jobs that are becoming more available. So here's a couple of examples of 
courses they offer. So you can do a course in airframe and power plant maintenance. Um, or you can do work in what they call CNC machining, which is kind of advanced manufacturing techniques uh, using uh, computers. And the idea is that you sort of uh, uh, get the skills you need after moving out of uh, your old occupation into these new growing industries. So, um, you know, so that, that gives quite an optimistic vision that we can, we can uh, help these workers with this trans transition. Um, but... Um, <coughs> You know, these things have had mixed success in the past. Uh, so some of these, these things don't work very well. So a key challenge for governments and for uh, economists going forward is to think about what is best practice in these kind of schemes, what kind of policies uh, uh, work best, and which ones uh, don't work as well, uh, and to think about that. So uh, I've covered a couple of points about trade. There are a lot of others, a lot of things I didn't cover. Um, so we've left quite a lot of time left o over for uh, questions, if you have them. Um, so yes, but for this part of the lecture, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. That was fantastic. Can everyone hear me at the back if I speak like this, or do you need my microphone? No, we good. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I'm just going to use my privilege as chair to ask Peter a question before I open it up to you guys. Um, so Peter, you set out a nice toy model of how we get these advantages of comparative advantage and everyone can do better from free trade. But if you look for anecdotes of the effects of trade, we, it's very easy to find people with negative experiences of trade openness and it's very hard to find people who would sing the praises of how much trade has done for them. Can you just say a bit more about how much evidence economists have that this sort of toy model really plays out in the real world at a macro level? Yeah. So, well, a good example of that is to think a bit more about the, uh, the China shock. So in that case, there were a group of economists that really studied the negative impacts that had on the, on the labor market or the manufacturing jobs that were lost, how some regions were really <coughs> badly affected. Um, but there's also been economists who've been looking at um, uh, the kind of uh, industries that grew as a result of the China shock. So there was this big increase, not only in American imports from China, but also in exports as well. And when you actually look at which of those created more demand for labor, or creating more new jobs, it was actually the exports that um, uh, uh, outweighed the effects of uh, the imports. And those exports were in things like high-end manufacturing, and indirectly, those exports created a lot of jobs in uh, American services supplying those industries. Um, and what's nice about that example is it pretty well illustrates the forces I was trying to explain earlier. So yes, America was now importing more stuff, but at the same time, its exports increased. So it was, again, it was, it was specializing in certain activities, so it was shifting away from those industries where it didn't have a comparative advantage and where China uh, did. Um, and the other thing is, of course, so as well as people losing their jobs, there are all these kind of um, less visible benefits to consumers. So those people buying, you know, um, uh, clothing and furniture and things like that, they now have benefited from these lower prices as a result of this increased trade. Um, and that's tended to actually benefit lower income groups um, more than other income groups. Um, so some of those jobs that were created, they may be jobs that people wouldn't actually necessarily associate with being created by trade. So people employed in high-end manuf manufacturing have demand for haircuts or restaurant services and yes, things. Yeah, exactly. It actually creates jobs yeah. you might not associate with being positively related exactly. to Exactly. So there's this indirect effect on services employment that you kind of doesn't look like a tradable industry, but actually there's trade going on there, or they're benefiting from trade. Um, okay. Great. Right, I'll now open up to questions. I'll take maybe three or four questions, and then we can take them together. So let's start down here. Um, you spent a lot of the, almost all of the talk, spent um, almost all of it talking about goods, manufacturing, agriculture. Um, but in the modern age, um, almost all developed economies um, majority service-based economies. UK is a prime example of that. Um, can, can these principles of free trade be applied to services such as the financial sector in the United Kingdom, having financial passports to access the United Kingdom? Can these same principles be applied to that? 
or do we need to look elsewhere in economics to understand this situation? Uh, could you just elaborate on your um, uh, first uh, proposed solution there, to your social contract um, in compensating people who lose out? Are you going, is that to be done through the tax and benefit system? And is it going to operate at the level of the individual, at the corporation or the government? I'd just be grateful if you could just expand on that, please. When, sorry. Yeah. Uh, when Ricardo was writing his work, um, he was considered to be a political economist rather than just a pure economist. So um, at that time, most of the production was kind of regulated by the government. And uh, we're living actually in the epoch of liberalism, where you know, kind of most of the production is in the private sector. So it will be hard, it will be really tough to create all these kind of job opportunities and everything and for the government to allocate the resources for education and kind of to see those opportunities. So to a certain extent the government should become a business to kind of look forward, you know, and kind of have a vision what would happen in the next 20 or 30 years, which is um, how would you approach this and how would you kind of um, tackle uh, this problem? And um, like a just quick um, addition to this question is those people who um, could be transferred, right? How many times would they require to be transferred because the industry can evolve very quickly, right? And they can kind of uh, fill the spaces exactly, you know, the same pattern. So um, would it mean that people have to switch two or three times during their lifetime or something like that? Thank you. Yes, yeah. So uh, this is really great because these are all really good questions. So that's a good start. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so the first question, so the modern age is more about uh, uh, services. So the UK is an 80% services economy, less trade in, uh, is involved in goods. Uh, so there's, there's two points for that. So first of all, it doesn't matter what kind of trade you're talking about, the principle of comparative advantage still applies. So when the UK specializes in financial services, that's its comparative advantage. Uh, the uh, second thing is that uh, a lot of trade or a lot of the effects of trade um, um, are actually, it's a bit like you described, they're kind of disguised. So when the UK exports a car, um, yes, that's the final output that they're exporting. But in order to produce that car, you had to uh, employ you know, business services, there'll be consultants involved, there'll be all kinds of service industries, design, all kinds of services industries involved in that production chain. And so when you look at those industries, you see, oh, those industries aren't exporting a lot. But what they're doing is they're contributing to the um, production of these tradable goods, which then are exported. Um, and that matters because if you're thinking about, say, the impact of, say, trade tariffs on a manufacturing good, you can't just think about those people who are involved directly in that manufacturing good, you also have to think about the derived demand um, uh, that's going to, the sort of knock-on impacts that are going to be on, say, service sector employment that you wouldn't necessarily think about unless you took into account those uh, sort of um, uh, linkages. Um, uh, so the second one is, yes, yeah, so the social contract. How can we make that uh, work? Uh, so one, one way is... is the tax and benefit system. So as you say, so that, you know, it's supposed, it's progressive, taxes are progressive in this country. You take things from people who are doing well and you give to people who are doing less well. Uh, one of the uh, downsides of the tax and benefit system or relying on the tax and benefit system alone is that, as you say, it depends on your characteristics as an individual. Um, but trade shocks don't uh, work like that. It's not like, um, you know, me just having bad luck and then me needing to be helped out, uh, you know, the region you're in matters because, as we saw, you know, some regions are really badly affected. Workers can't easily move between regions. The industry you're in matters. So if it's an industry-wide shock, it's going to be difficult for you to move, you know, you're going to be in a worse situation than someone who's unemployed for another reason. Um, so when you're thinking about um, uh, uh, people being displaced by trade, there might also be a case for um, uh, what they call place-based policies, for example. So, you know, uh, transfers between regions, and that could take various forms, and I'm, I'm not going to 
you know, say that I have definitive answers on what the right thing to do is, but you know, you can invest in infrastructure in those regions, or you could just involve in more fiscal transfers to those regions. Um, uh, but it's yeah, I think I think uh, sort of what was underlying the question is, is is right to think we know we should be thinking broader than just the the, the tax and benefits that are trying to rely on the tax and benefit system um, by itself. Uh, and then the third point, um, so which is. Um, Yes, yeah, so it's a, it's a question about the role of the public sector uh, in all of this. Um, so, yeah, David Ricardo was a political economist. Uh, part of this is anthropology. So um, what I mean by that is people use terms in different ways. So in those days, the subject was called uh, political economy. So just what we nowadays would call an economist, uh, they would have called a political economist. Um, uh, uh, so the, the role of the, production, uh, the public sector, um, so you know, we know from our economics courses, or you know, so economists are told that uh, the role of the public sector is intervening when there's a market failure. And job training is one of those areas where uh, there are particular market failures. So if you're a firm and uh, you hire someone um, uh, who's lost their job through trade, and you want to retrain them, you invest in that person's retraining, uh, you could invest a lot in getting that person to work for your firm, and then they could go work for another firm, and then you would have lost that uh, investment. Uh, and so that creates, um, uh, the role for the public sector is um, the situation where firms aren't capturing all the benefits from investing in training, so they're under invest in training, uh, and what the public sector can do is it can sort of fill that gap by uh, helping people um, you know, either through, say, that community college scheme or something like that, or by directly subsidizing uh, trading uh, activities. Um, but all that requires a kind of active role for the public sector in these kind of things. Um, okay, should we take so, a few more? Yeah, can I just add to a couple of oh, sure, the, yeah, no, no, the points course. that you're making? Um, so on, on the first point about services trade versus goods trade, um, like, certainly as a journalist trying to research Brexit, increasingly what I've become aware of is that although the theory of the trade in the two may be quite similar, um, the sort of practicalities of what, what things do you need to worry about in order to ensure free trade in goods and services are quite different from one another. So in, in goods, we talk about um, tariff barriers and sort of regulations on the quality of the product. In services, there's much more of a role for things like free movement of people, because many services are delivered by somebody going somewhere to deliver that service, even in the world of um, highly digitalized, internet-based things, people still actually physically <coughs> go somewhere to deliver the service. So the sort of practicalities and the political discussion around trade and services is quite different and some, some different things come up there. Um, on the, uh, your question about the role for government, I mean, the, the sort of history of the British government in the 1970s trying to pick winning industries and have an industrial strategy wasn't particularly um, glorious. So I guess there's a sort of nervousness about the idea that government should be trying to predict what will be Britain's winning industries in the future, but whether there's a, a space for policy to try and set the right conditions that allow the private sector to do that is, I guess, the difficult area. Great, so more questions. We've got one up there. Well, I think it was your, your last slide, the best of both worlds. Yeah. You, you had three items, a social contract, gradualism, and to help people adjust. That sounded to uh, been a bit older than some of the people here, even, uh, the, <laughs> even the presenters. Uh, I can remember when we had social, uh, social democracy, and that's what it was all about. The manifestos of the, of the 60s would be, uh, you could have written that slide off it. But of course, since then, we've uh, moved into this neoliberal thing where there's no such thing as society. So we seem to have the wrong the completely wrong attitude, not just politically, but ideologically throughout society. And uh, uh, I could almost despair that uh, if we're looking for these values, they're not there at all now. Okay, should we take this more? Uh, oh, there's a, the mic microphone's coming away. Yeah. 
And my question is, um, is the evidence around some of the, say, more higher tax economies, such as Sweden and the Scandinavian countries, having a better sort of result to the China shock than America? Um, what do you think of, I've heard a few Conservative Party politicians in particular advocating unilaterally remove, abolishing all taxes when we leave the EU um, rather than negotiating trade deals presumably, just unilaterally say zero taxes on all our imports. What do you think the impact of that policy would be? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so the first one, so it's a, in a way it's another question, what is the proper role of government? Uh, in all of these things. Um, um, it's a difficult and big question. So the, um, I suppose, so one, one, so one metaphor that I like to think about when, when people have talked about how to deal with uh, uh, people that aren't doing very well is, so there's either you have a kind of safety net which is designed to sort of stop people falling through, ensure a sort of minimum standard of living and things. It's an important function for the welfare state. And then there's what they call uh, a trampoline. So where if someone falls down, they're able to spring back up again. Um, and uh, so I guess what the last, last slide was trying to say is, um, you know, we want to be as flexible we can in sort of helping people deal with shocks. Um, and we need to account for the fact that there's likely to be several shocks, um, which brings back to the point you made about, um, you know, people having to move uh, jobs several times in their, their lifetime. Uh, and to encourage that kind of flexibility, one is, you, you know, you need to have some sort of, uh, uh, you know, retraining schemes are one thing, but uh, you might also need to think about, you know, before someone enters uh, the labor market today, we need to make sure that they're adaptable enough uh, through the schooling system that they can work in several occupations in their life. So they have those key skills in, you know, computing and soft skills and things like that. They're useful in multiple occupations. Um, um, yes, um, and then the evidence, yes, so on other countries' experience of the China shock. So uh, there's been a sort of cottage industry of people investigating the China shock in, in different places. Um, uh, so one interesting case was Germany, where uh, the researchers there found that uh, the effects were not nearly as large as they were in the United States. Um, and they attributed that for, to several reasons. Firstly, um, just the increase in imports was not as big in Germany as it was, was in China. Uh, and the second thing was, is there was this, um, so uh, one of the tr things China really needed was kind of advanced capital goods and machinery, which Germany was producing. So at the same time, Germany had this big increase uh, um, in exports. I remember also that some people looked at it in Norway uh, and what they found there was that um, the shock had more of an effect on wages than on employment. So they think it's because, so it's, it's, well, it's um, you have more protections on uh, uh, your employment in Norway than you do uh, uh, in, say, the United States. Um, so it means that firms weren't laying off workers. What they would do was would lower their wages instead. But again, they weren't they weren't as as strongly affected by the China shock as as, as the United States. Um, and then the final question was about unilateral trade liberalisation. So uh, yeah, so um, I wrote about this at the beginning of the week. Um, uh, so pluses and minuses. So the pluses are you get these advantages of free trade that we were sort of talking about now. So you're more likely to specialize in the industries of comparative advantage. There'll be gains to consumers. Um, um, one of the things to sort of take into account is that, um, you know, so the tariffs the EU currently imposes, they're high for some goods, but on average, they are not high. Um, so the average tariff on the kind of goods the UK is importing is less than 3%. So that kind of puts a cap on the gains you can get uh, as a consumer. And then the, the downsides of, um, uh, of unilateral you know, tariff liberalization is, first of all, there are particular industries that will be particularly affected and you need to be able to deal with that. Uh, and the second thing is, you know, you want to use these things as um, uh, bargaining chips when you're persuading other people to open their markets. And if the first thing you've done is eliminated all tariffs to begin with, 
you know, what are you going to do? How, how are you going to then persuade them to um, uh, reduce tariffs on your exports? Um, so that, yes, so, well, you know, there's trade-offs as always, so there's costs and benefits of doing that, but um, that's my take on that. Uh, um, on that one, Peter's probably too reticent to mention other people's models of um, unilateral free trade and the benefits thereof that are kicking around at the moment. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the most prominent one that's in the public domain that predicts very big gains from unila unilateral free trade is the one from the Economists for Free Trade um, group. And I think one of the big things that they have in their model that predicts very big wins is that they assume not just getting rid of tariff barriers, but non-tariff barriers as well, um, which in their model is done in a slightly odd way because they assume that non-tariff barriers are currently extremely high and seems to boil down to saying that we would be happy to have children's toys with lead in them coming in from China and absolutely no restrictions on the quality of products that we would accept, um, which obviously raises a different set of issues. Great. More questions? Hi. So um, I was also wondering about, so specialization from comparative advantage can often lead to um, certain particular, for example, crops if, uh, becoming over-reliant, or, or I should say the countries becoming over-reliant on a particular type of crop. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on such issues as climate change or a disease which is external to the market having an effect on the over-reliant countries on that good. Thank you. Uh, there's another one down here. Uh, sorry, Ralph. One just down here. Okay. Okay. Do you want to go first then, as you've got a microphone? In context of the term "kicking away the ladder" and also the re and subsidies that China has provided to some of its industries, leading to its success in it, uh, its export-led model, do you believe that there are some countries that would benefit from having tariffs and not participating in free trade um, until they develop their infant industries? Uh, just adding to the uh, first point, would you suggest that there's possibly an over-specialisation of, of the financial market within the UK at the moment? And there's a danger of that actually being, again, following possibly the recession or another recession further on down the line, it'd be um, quite damaging for the UK economy because of that over-specialisation. Okay, yes, yeah, so I'm um, just thinking. <laughs> um, so, that, yeah, there's two questions about um, the nature of specialization. So, yes, as Abby said, trade means that countries start specializing in an area of comparative <coughs> advantage. Uh, and this is what we call, you know, a static model. So the situation's um, uh, completely unchanging. You switch from one industry to another, and that's, that's, that's the kind of end of it. But uh, there's a, a set of important questions about it matters what your comparative advantage is in. So you might have, um, and this is the reason that why countries compete with each other to have certain industries. So the United States, um, you know, has benefited enormously from the presence of Silicon Valley. Um, so in doing that, it's specializing in comparative advantage. That's good. They're better at doing that than other countries. But as a result of that, there are all kinds of advantages to the United States. So, you know, um, there might be, you know, companies like Google, they might generate big monopoly rents. That's a more innovative industry than other types of industries, so the technology is improving. That might have uh, spillovers for uh, other things. So there's a, a question of, um, uh, you know, you want to have a comparative advantage in particular things, and you might want to make strategic investments uh, 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 to produce that kind of effect. And that sort of relates to the kind of question about financial services and things. So, that, you know, it's again, it's... Um, uh, you know, in the trading system, they might think that there are uh, advantages. Well, there's, uh, the, you know, the UK's comparative advantage is in financial services in some ways. Um, and then, you know, are there potential externalities involved in that industry? Because then it's British regulators that are on the hook if those in industries fail and we have to bail, bail them out. Um, and uh, what's neat is that the last question about infant industry, um, you know, it's, it, it speaks to the same issue. So it's about the question of, you know, if you could choose your comparative advantage, what would it be in? 
Um, um, and you know, there are certainly models that tariff barriers can help you um, achieve a particular specialization. I am absolutely no expert at all on how well that has worked in the past or in practice or, or things like that. Um, so I, I can't say I mean, too much about that. I mean, the world trading system in a way helps some of those countries with infant industries because developing countries typically have zero tariffs applied to their goods um, when importing to countries like the UK and the EU, precisely for that reason that the EU recognises that these are developing countries who haven't yet got their industries up and running. And so to give them a bit of a head start, the EU is willing to accept their imports without putting tariffs on them. Um, but once those countries then become middle income, suddenly they move into a new category and tariffs start to be imposed on them. So there are some bits of the world's trading system that actually kind of help those um, infant industries. Um, on the financial services question, I mean, it seems to me there's something about financial services that's a bit separate from um, trade specialisation, which is that with the benefit of hindsight, there were risks in the financial sector that we thought it was an industry that was as profitable as it was before the crisis without realising what risks were being built up around it. And perhaps with hindsight, you wouldn't necessarily not want the industry, but you might build in more safeguards or acknowledge that the very high profits that were generated before the crisis were a bit of a one-off and you wanted to bank some of that rather than rely on it forever. Great. We still have 10 minutes if there are more questions. Uh, hi, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, so recently, the BBC reported that after UK leaves the EU, uh, the passport will be changed back to its uh, royal blue colour. And uh, interestingly, the passport will be made in France. So my question is, um, do you think this you know, there's a sense of nationalism here, and how do you, how do you sort of solve this uh, sense of nationalism that, you know, may be acting as a friction to trade? Um, hi, uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, around Thatcher, they had the industrial strategy. UK had it, um, and now. Indeed, uh, the UK government uh, asked some of the academics here in Manchester to create one, and they have done so. Um, and you also mentioned that uh, Japan and Colombia uh, are taking an awful long time to sort out their deals. So within those two examples, well, which hope do you give of UK creating new deals for their new partners? And um, how, as an advising board, you, you advise the government to create um, these strategies looking forward to prioritizing which industries and avoiding companies such as Unilever uh, leaving the, the UK and how, what's the role of, of the advisory board in helping companies now um, select which country best fits their supply chain? Do we have one more question for this round? Can I ask one? Yeah. <laughs> um, it relates to the, to the second part, point in your last suggestion, the gradualism uh, proposal. Have you got any examples where any serious degree of gradualism was uh, designed into any policies? I, I remember in 1993, giving away my age, listening to talk about climate change in Germany and their suggestion was, you know, really we should introduce carbon type taxes, but gradually to give certainty. But of course, that hasn't happened. So have you got any example where that ever worked? Yeah. So I think, so I'll answer the, the last question first. Um, so, uh, so example of gradualism. So actually, when China joined the WTO, um, so WTO rules mean certain things. So it means you can't set tariffs too high on other people's uh, exports. And you're sort of um, uh, limited in the things, the things you can do to prevent exports coming into your country. Um, but there are certain exceptions to that. So one is if you have a free trade deal with the country concerned, um, subject to certain conditions. Uh, the other one is you might have moral objections to certain things, like Saudi Arabia doesn't, isn't forced to import pornography as a result of WTO rules. Uh, and uh, the third one is uh, if there's an unexpected uh, 
uh, surge in imports from a particular location. And in the textile industry, so at the end of uh, uh, something related called the multi-fiber agreement, uh, which did actually phase so each country was allocated a quota. You could export so much, and that was kind of phased uh, out over time. Um, and when that ended, there was an explosion in Chinese exports of textiles. So all these factories had been gearing up, waiting for that uh, agreement to expire, and then they ramped up uh, export production. And that led to um, uh, both the EU, well, uh, certainly the EU applying what they called safeguards on those exports. And it led to a, a huge trade dispute in sort of mid 2000s. It was called the Bra Wars. Um, because so Chinese imports would come in and be, they'd force, they would be stuck in the warehouse. They wouldn't be allowed to, to leave. But that was an attempt uh, by governments to try and sort of manage uh, uh, the, the, the change in imports. But on the question of something like carbon taxes, so a key question uh, you have to answer when you're uh, trying to engage in any kind of smooth transition is you need to think about, am I credible when I say I'm really going to get rid of that tariff? Because, so if you say, I'll abolish that tariff in five years' time, so prepare, and then all the industries involved just don't prepare, then when you get to that point where you're going to abolish the, the tariff, um, you know, are you really going to be able to do it? Because they'll say, you know, we haven't been preparing, so what are you going to do? And then you might say, okay, you've got another five years, and then you've got another five years. Um, so there's a kind of, there's a political economy issue there in that, uh, you know, when you say you're going to do something, you have to have some way of, of credibly promising it. Um, so there's the other two questions, blue passports and um, how easy it to sign trade deals. I'll let Gemma take the first go on those questions. Um, um, so on blue passports and uh, nationalism, I now forget who asked the question, I'm not there. Um, I mean, my feeling is there clearly is a sense of nationalism around the Brexit debate. Um, and actually, it's not something that I think economists can have a lot to say on. You don't, nationalism doesn't feature terribly highly in most economic models. But that's not to say that it shouldn't be part of the political calculus. And if members of the UK population feel better living in a country where we may have lower income, but we have a sense of control over our laws and our lives, and we really value our blue British passport being made by a firm in Cheshire rather than a firm in Paris, um, then that is a perfectly legitimate political outcome. Um, but it's not what a pure sort of economic um, balancing up of the pros and cons would give you. Um, on the question about whether we can make progress on uh, trade deals. Um, so I guess if you take the most positive view of what the UK can do on its own outside the EU negotiating trade deals, um, there are always these trade-offs between um, different vested interests within a country um, that you want to protect. <coughs> And within the EU, those are undoubtedly more difficult to uh, square. And uh, for example, in the EU's negotiations with the Mercosur countries, one of the major issues has been a reluctance of many EU countries to accept agricultural imports from those uh, South American countries. Now, it might be that that is less of an issue for the UK. The UK may, will, may well be willing to trade off agricultural imports in exchange for access to financial services markets in South America. Um, so it, it's clearly there is possibility out there that there are deals that the UK would be willing to do on its own that it couldn't get past the EU28. Great. Um, so we are just about on the end of our 2.30 deadline. So unless there's any one final burning question. Um, Thank oh, there is one final burning question, okay. Uh, is there any examples in which the David Ricardo model doesn't hold, uh, where the overall outcome is not better? For example, uh, he probably assumed the competitive advantage is constant through time. Maybe they changed during the free trade agreement. Thank you. Um, hmm. So 
what I'm trying to think. So, so, what, so I mean, in one sense, it's sort of logically true that when you have a set of tasks and you want to decide how to divide them up amongst countries or people, the best way to do it, and this is an important thing to remember for your personal and professional lives as well as for international trade, is to specialize according to comparative advantage rather than absolute advantage. Um, uh, I mean, so, um, you know, if countries' comparative advantage shifted over time, you know, you'd expect the patterns of specialization to shift over time. Um, does it ever result in countries being worse off from trade? I'm pretty sure there are models that can give you that. However, off the top of my head, I can't sort of think of, uh, I, can't, I just can't remember the mechanisms. Um, I, mean, I guess in practice, there's probably a difference between what happens in the short term and what happens in the long term, because over a long enough time period, even if a country's comparative advantage shifts, if there aren't barriers in place to shifting the way resources are used, you should see the countries sort of reallocate the way they're using their resources. Obviously, in the short term, that may not be what you actually see happening, be my guess. Fantastic. Well, thank you all very much for coming. And thank you to the Manchester Economics Department for making this possible, and particularly to Vic and Josefina for actually doing all the hard work of getting us all here today. And thank you to Peter for a fantastic presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you.